Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, and Paul Boyer. Coming up on DTNS, what's actually going on with the social media moderation law in Texas? Microsoft's plans to let you use game disks on consoles that don't have optical drives. And Meta's plan to mix reality for the workplace. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 12th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, it's so good that you're from Texas and originally from Florida today, Justin. Oh, yeah. No, the two <laughs> troublemaker states always. What did it all mean? <laughs> all right, they're in the spotlight today. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal sent a memo to employees announcing that head of product Kayvon Bigpour is leaving the company and Jay Sullivan will take over the chief of product job that Bigpour was, uh, had for the last several years. Twitter is also freezing most hiring and cutting spending. On Twitter, Bigpour interrupted his paternity leave to say, this wasn't my decision. Parag asked me to leave after letting me know that he wants to take the team in a different direction. The Oversight Board, sometimes called the Facebook Oversight Board, but the actual name is just the Oversight Board, uh, rules both on appeals over moderation decisions as well as policy questions, so far entirely related to Meta's Facebook. Facebook is bound to respect the moderation rulings, but only has to consider the advice in the policy rulings. That said, the board has made 18 policy recommendations, and Meta has implemented 14 of them. Recently, Meta asked the board to advise on its policies regarding the war in Ukraine. You may recall that Facebook has made an exception to its prohibition against calls for violence if the posts are about Russian soldiers operating in Ukraine. There were also questions about when it should be allowed to show dead bodies or videos of prisoners of war criticizing the conflict, whether it should adapt uh, its rules to this particular situation. However, late last month, Meta withdrew the request to review those policies. The Verge's Casey Newton talked to the members of Meta and the board and found that the withdrawal was done over concerns that whatever decision the board might make, Russia might use it as an excuse to retaliate against employees and relatives in Russia. But Newton points out that's something that Russia has already done in response to previous Facebook decisions. NVIDIA is publishing their Linux GPU kernel modules as open source. NVIDIA has offered Linux drivers for years, but they were always proprietary. So NVIDIA's user space software remains closed. Well, but it's mostly good news. That's good. Uh, Swedish-backed scientists have published a paper in the journal Scientific Reports showing their findings on the effect of video games on 5,000 children aged 10 to 12. Uh, the children were asked to report how often they played video games. On average, they reported an hour a day. The scientists then tested the children on reading comprehension, attention and memory, visual spatial processing, and learning ability. They controlled for socioeconomic and genetic factors and found that over the space of two years, children in the top 17% of hours playing games, the children who played more than an hour of video games a day, showed an increase in their IQ of 2.5 points over the average. Sonos officially launched its budget soundbar, the Sonos Ray, starting at $279. So, you know, it's budget depending on who you are. It's budget for Sonos, I suppose. It supports AirPlay 2 and most major music streaming services. It also features touch controls on the top to raise that can be used with a Sonos One for surround sound. No built-in mic though, no HDMI, and no Dolby Atmos support, but it does ship June 7th. Sonos also announced its voice control service will launch next month, which lets users control music streaming on Sonos speakers with built-in mics. All right, let's talk a little more about Meta's mixed reality strategy. We've heard about Project Cambria before. Meta has now demonstrated it in a video, although they blurred out the form factor because it's not ready yet, so they didn't want you to get any ideas. It's kind of weird that they blurred it out, but they did. Uh, it is the follow-up to the Quest 2 that's supposed to launch this year. It's supposed to launch by the end of the year. Sarah, what, what did we see? 
Well, so Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg shared a video. We didn't really offer much, honestly. I mean, kind of looked cool. It, you know, you sort of had like a Pokemon type thing going on. Uh, but uh, but yeah, as you said, <laughs> the the headset itself was pixelated out, <laughs> and you know, it just it was just it was a teaser video. That's what it was. What we do know is Cambria is a VR headset that is going to use its camera to pa use pass through color video from outside and blend in virtual objects. Now, if you're not familiar with VR headsets, this is uh, something that has been done before, but you know we're still in the early days of this. Protocol has seen how it works and says it's not photorealistic, but it's akin to decent quality home video, say. So definitely a step up from the Quest 2 for anybody who, who's familiar with that. Cambria's image sensors are also higher resolution, and that allows for better, uh, better object separation. It also has an active IR projector for accurate, uh, accurate depth sensing. Now, content and apps are created on something called the Presence platform. Access to Presence is being added to the Quest SDK, so mixed reality could and will be cross-developed to the Quest 2, but that'll be at a lower quality than the Cambria because they're just different headsets. It's positioned for professional work, you know, support for virtual monitors, that kind of thing. Also might be usable for fitness. In fact, Zuckerberg said that specifically. And I would say that would be especially if the headset could be designed to use outside because the Quest 2 is very much not. All right, uh, that uh, because the Quest Two only offers a grayscale view of the real world. You you can get a view of the real world, but it's very blurry and gray, right? Yes, it's very like Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Like when you watch it, you're like, okay, I can kind of see my room. I'm just gonna like you know make sure that my room boundary is okay. There's not much else you can do with it, and it's it's somewhat of a disconcerting experience when you're in there because it's like they even have like a kind of like a low rumble when you're using the grayscale video, like, yeah, because it's meant for boundary setting. It's not, it wasn't really yeah, designed. For there's this. nothing really more to do except to kind of make sure you have your bearings and know where you are. So you can use the presence to create something for the quest too, but it's going to be a little weird. Whereas it obviously project Cambria is going to be good because it's color and it's high res. Well, it's going to be better for yeah. sure. So yeah. yeah. So uh, Zuckerberg also announced that there was going to be a demo mixed reality app called the world beyond downloadable soon in quest Two's app lab. So, you know, people can play around with it. The app was mentioned kind of in passing, honestly, at last year's connect conference. So obviously the company has been working on it for a while. It seems like a way to explore what mixed reality can do on VR headsets rather than doing a whole lot itself. And as you mentioned, there are other mixed reality headsets that are blacked out VR headsets that do pass through, right? Yeah. So Meta expects Project Cambria to ship sometime this year. Sounds great. But uh, you might be listening to this and saying, but other companies are doing this already, right? Yeah, like Project Barjo, the XR3, similar headset already available, also tailored for things like training, engineering, medical research purposes, very much still not in a consumer uh, bucket, but it doesn't mean that we can't get there. So what, what I find fascinating about this, number one, is that like low key, this is a pretty important uh, product for Meta. Uh, uh, you know, Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus, uh, has, I think, correctly said that when Facebook bought Oculus, uh, Oculus became Facebook. There's a reason why they changed their name to Meta and not something else. They want this to be a hardware hit for them in the way that the Quest 2 has been, in my opinion, the best of breed in terms of commercial VR. I'll say this, though. I thought that teaser was bad. Uh, I, I, oh, I it was terrible. I don't think that it made that platform look interesting. I don't think that it gave any kind of real world context for what you would want to buy on there. I think that game looks kind of silly. And I personally think it, it is only designed so Zuckerberg looks more human, which is an uphill climb. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how human he looks. I, I, this, this, is, this is meant for the enterprise, so it's probably not going to hurt it. Because you're going to sell this is thing. Is it for the enterprise? Yeah, that's what they're saying. They're like, this is for the workplace. This is for the enterprise. They're yeah. going to have other consumer follow-ups to the Quest. I know we called this the follow-up so, to the so, Quest, so but it's follow-up the Quest in technology. This is going to be pitched for for uses in the in the workplace. 
So the the demo that includes the Kmart Lilo and Stitch creature running around your floor. Well, that's what's so weird about that demo. Like, I don't think the demo hurts them because they're going to sell this hand to hand, but it certainly didn't advance that notion, did it? I I I was not impressed. I love the quest too, and I am a huge huge believer. Same, in what they same. Do. Uh, Use it all the time. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, this this was not something that that particularly the buoyed my spirits. And I, I'm always come f coming from the consumer perspective, and I know that you know that the use cases of this are not always consumers. In fact, very much more enterprise. But I was sort of like, okay, okay, if the if the pass through video can be a little bit more real world, right? Like, not not the best, but better than what I have right now. I could, I don't know, do my workouts outside and feel a little bit more uh, like it is. It is a real thing rather than something that, you know, I put on the headset and now like the real world around me doesn't exist anymore. Both are fine, but they're different experiences. Uh, just what, one last very quick thing on this. Facebook needs this to be a commercial hit. They do not. They, they don't want this to be an enterprise product. They want this to be a commercial hit. They want to go diversify themselves from the game they're in now, which is effectively what Google is doing, ad sales, and make it a little bit more Apple. For that, they need this to be more iPhone than Google Glass. Which right They now. need the Quest to be that, not Cambria. I, I think they Cambria is a new part that. of the strategy. They, Cambria they, is a new part of the strategy, which is let's get a high-end business use case, and then we could trickle it down into the Quest. They'll have follow-ups to the Quest, and you're absolutely right about the Quest, but that doesn't mean Cambria has to be a consumer hit. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm not saying Cambria specifically. I mean okay. this entire genre. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about Microsoft's patents. Uh, Game Rant noticed that Microsoft had a patent published last week on a method for validating Xbox game discs for the Xbox Series S. The S is the one that doesn't have an optical drive. Uh, patents always use vague terminology, so it kind of goes all over the place. But essentially, it describes a system where you put the disc in another device presumably another Xbox, maybe a Windows PC, and then you validate your ownership on that. It then describes all the possible ways it could transfer that game to the Series S. Uh, but among the ones that seem possible are validation with an Xbox Live account, and then you download the game to the Series S. I think that's the one that most people would find compelling. There was also live streaming from one device to the other. That's kind of something that's already sort of available. And one intri intriguing bit about downloading the game from the disc to the Series S over a LAN so that you weren't using your internet. You would you would actually legally rip it from the disc to your Series S. One of the, um, I think the best parts of the patent described is the need for the system. Like, what do you need to make use of this? Microsoft wrote, quote, many owners of physical video games, Mia, have emotional attachments to their physical video game media. These owners simply appreciate the feel of handling the physical video game media and were the nostalgia associated with the physical video game media. Moreover, many of these owners view their libraries of physical game media and paraphernalia as valuable collections, similarly to rare coins collections or baseball, uh, baseball card collections, etc. So they're going to make NFTs out of them. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> or they just want people to still buy physical media. No, it's kind of crazy that how much about the feelings are in this patent. Because let, let's forget about arguing whether this is actually patentable or not. Uh, it actually hasn't been granted yet. Maybe it won't be, but it probably will be. Uh, Microsoft went to great lengths there to be like, we care about video gamers. And that that is why we would do this. Uh, because video gamers have aged into their prime spending years mm -hmm. and if they can sell a, <laughs> a, 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 a big super deluxe copy of a game that has already been purchased probably three times by some super gamers, but this is the super elite deluxe version, then they will do it. And they just want to make sure that you are able to authenticate it and play it, even if they come out with a diskless uh, 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 option. But yeah, mm. look, all technology. I think this was a fascinating thing that we saw with the iPod uh, being discontinued and and uh, uh, then becoming a gigantic seller as Apple burned through their remnants just by saying that there was going to be no more. All of a sudden, all of the nostalgia that comes back from people living their formative years with these gadgets come back and you realize, oh, I got some extra money. Let me buy one of these last things. Yeah. I, it feels overly complex. I mean, we, we've we seen EA, Roger was reminding us earlier uh, today that we've seen EA and Blizzard do versions of this where you can just register 
your game and then it's stored in the cloud for you. You don't have to have the disc anymore. Uh, Voodoo what has been doing a thing where you can pay a little bit of money and register your DVD to your cloud account and have the movie there. And in, in none of those cases, do you actually need to put the optical disc in a drive? So, but that's part of the experience, right? Well, like that's, that that's what it, that Maybe. just the same way that you open up your baseball card collection, you yep. can feel the yep. creak of the plastic. That's <laughs> part of that tactile experience. Uh, well, if you want to discover more tactile experiences, uh, you can get ideas from people in our audience in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Hey, Tom, do you remember September 2021? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Well, <laughs> my anniversary is there. Texas passed HB 20, a law against the banning, demonetizing, or otherwise restricting of social media content based on, quote, the viewpoint of the user or another person, end quote. And that kicked off lawsuit. <laughs> indeed, indeed it did. A uh, trade association called Net Choice has sued Texas, alleging that law violates the U.S. First Amendment protection against the government abridging freedom of speech. And in December, a Texas federal dis district court judge granted a preliminary injunction against the bill going into effect until the court case was resolved. It was an injunction. It said, let's not apply the law until the case is settled. However, Texas appealed the decision to the circuit court, Court of Appeals, and it was heard by a panel of three of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judges. That's a normal way of doing things. You just, you, you don't have all of the judges. You have a panel of three. So Wednesday, the Fifth Circuit ruled two to one to grant a stay on the preliminary injunction, uh, meaning basically we're not going to let the injunction go into effect, meaning the law goes into effect instead. Now, a lot has been made of statements by the judges during deliberation. One of the judges said that social media platforms weren't websites. Uh, another tried to compare social media posts to phone calls. There was a lot of talk about common carrier. In the end, as much fun as you may have batting those comments around, it doesn't bear much on the case because the court did not rule on the merits. They're discussing the merits when they say those things. They did not rule on the merits. They didn't even issue their opinion yet, although we will get that eventually. Uh, they just sent out the stay, saying the preliminary injunction uh, doesn't go into effect. But you, Justin, live in Texas. Tell yeah. them what this law does for you. Y'all, HB20 allows laws <laughs> by private citizens as a remedy for violations. It's similar to some other more controversial laws that we have seen in Texas. Mm -hmm. So if a social media network with more than 50 million active U.S. users discriminates on viewpoint, the state of Texas or any Texas resident can sue. Here's the actual text. A social media platform may not censor a user, a user's expression, or a user's ability to receive the expression of another person based on the viewpoint of the user of that or another person, the viewpoint represented in the user's expression or another person's expression, or a user's geographic location in this state or any part of this state. But, bro, I'm also from Florida originally. <laughs> Florida has a similar law, SB 7072, but with the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Florida granting a preliminary injunction against that law, while a court case, also from Net Choice, challenges it on First Amendment grounds as well. So how are these cases going to go in the two most Justin Robert Young <laughs> of this Union. Time. Yeah. So we have conflicting decisions on the injunctions. We have the, the laws seemingly opposed by legal precedent and federal statute. Uh, keep in mind a few of these facts. These are those facts that you can now say you know when this comes up in the future. In 2017, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously, eight to nothing, with one abstention, one recusal, really, uh, eight to nothing, in a case called Packingham versus North Carolina striking down the idea of a state government putting limits on social media. There had been a North Carolina law passed prohibiting registered sex offenders from accessing commercial social networks. The court ruled that the law was unconstitutional because the state was attempting to restrict lawful speech. This is the decision in which the justices referred to social networks as the modern public town square. That opinion was written by Justice Kennedy and a concurrence was written by Justice Alito. 
the Florida's judge referenced Section 230 of the CDA. That's the other thing. So Packingham is one legal precedent. There's also a statute that was referenced by the Florida judge when the preliminary injunction was issued uh, saying that Section 230 would seem to prohibit this law from going into, into place. Section 230 specifically says any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access or availability of material that the provider, in this case social networks, uh, considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or, here's the key part, otherwise objectionable. If the platform finds it otherwise objectionable, they can limit it, and they're protected by Section 230, and they can't be held liable for anything that happens on their platform because of that. In other words, if a platform takes down content it finds objectionable, Section 230 protects it from being sued for making those decisions. Exactly what the Texas and Florida laws were trying to make happen. Sue them for making decisions about taking things down they found objectionable. So, all right, let's talk about what might happen next. And and you would think that the chaos is the point in this in, in the case of both these laws, that they want these companies to change their ways because they're afraid of dealing with the static, whether or not it is legally uh, in bounds. So if there was an opinion from the Texas circuit Net choice could bring a district split decision to the Supreme Court where the two districts, in this case, Texas and Florida, have ruled in conflict with each other on a similar issue. However, the Fifth Circuit is notoriously slow in bringing out its opinions, so net choice may not want to wait. Net choice could ask for what is called an unbank review of the decision where all the judges of the Fifth Circuit, not just the three judge panel, review the case again. However, it's not necessarily likely that they'd get a different decision when they ask the same people. Another option would be to appeal the ruling on the injunction directly to the Supreme Court. The idea would be to get the Supreme Court to review the case on what's called the shadow docket, which means they review the oral arguments. This is done rarely in cases that might cause large disruptions if a decision is delayed. But the opinion may not come fast if they go that route. And don't forget... This is all about injunctions. The main cases still need to be decided. If the Texas case and the Florida case ultimately come to opposite decisions, the outcome would then need to be settled by the Supreme Court at oral arguments. Tom, legal scholar though you are, how do you think that would go? <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is probably going to end up in the Supreme Court. It kind of looks that way, uh, one way or another. Uh, and so everyone's focusing on Justice Clarence Thomas, who has previously indicated that large tech platforms with substantial market power might be akin to common carriers. And there is legal precedent for requiring common carriers not to exclude legal uses of their service. But... Would that mean Thomas would uphold the Texas law or even the Florida law? And would any other justices join him on that? That's hard to say. Thomas joined Alito's concurrence on the case that overturned the North Carolina law. So he'd have to find a difference between these and that that he found legally compelling. And in a, another case called Manhattan Community Access Corp versus Halleck, the court found that private operators of public access channels that are receiving government funds are not subject to the constitutional requirement not to abridge free speech. In other words, they don't have to abide by the First Amendment because they're private. That opinion was written by Justice Kavanaugh and joined by Justice Roberts, Alito, Gorsuch, and particularly Thomas. So both by looking at the precedents in the law and how the justices have ruled in the past, these Florida and Texas laws do not look likely to stand up. And in the meantime, right now, it is illegal in Texas to moderate content based on the viewpoint of the poster. That applies to Yelp, Reddit, Tinder, Facebook, Twitter, and more, meaning all these platforms risk a lawsuit whenever they remove a post or otherwise moderate what's on their platform. Sarah, before we move on from this, does, does any of that uh, make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, what what I think I think we're dealing with right now is yeah, it, it's uh, it's we're trying to figure out state by state how these things are going to play out, and yeah, it's very messy. I mean, yeah, and I think that the chaos is the point here. 
just to uh, just to underline that again. What, what on the they, political side, the reason that these states put these laws in is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm saying the mechanism by making this about suing and not making this illegal, where the state is going to go seize a server or something like that. You are you are looking to affect the behavior of chill the, the platforms behavior. Mm -hmm. by saying, mm -hmm. well, you don't want to deal with a bunch of lawsuits, do you? Yeah. So, so maybe just leave everything up just in case. Maybe, maybe you move. Which is exactly why Section 230 was passed but on a bipartisan basis back in the 90s was they're like, but if we leave everything up, that's chaos. This yeah. has all happened before, Tom, and mm. it'll happen again. Indeed. Well, let's talk about black holes. Um, speaking of messy, um, <laughs> you might recall the movie The Black Hole from 1979. Mm. Uh, scared me a lot when I was a kid. I don't remember watching it in 1979. I would have been too young, but I definitely saw it later. Anyway, scientific researchers using the Event Horizon Telescope have captured a picture of a black hole at the heart of our very own Milky Way galaxy. Sagittarius A star, as it's known, or SGR A star, is bending all the light around it, which is something that's already been captured by the black hole named M87. That's something that researchers have, have already done a lot of extensive research on, but they're very different black holes. SAG's hole, I know it sounds weird, but it, it's, it's a hole, is over 1,000 times smaller and less massive. And you might say, okay, well, maybe it's not a big deal. No, it's still really massive. <laughs> it's measuring at 4 million times more massive than our sun. Although M87's counterpart is billions of times more massive. So, wow, we are talking about quite a bit of space being taken up in space. The researchers developed new imaging tools, including a mix of supercomputing power to analyze and combine data and black hole simulations to help compare their findings, make sure that they knew what they were doing and they saw what they thought that they saw. The project took five years to complete, factoring in 100 million hours of supercomputing time at the U.S. National Science Foundation. So in other words, and this we, is why you don't go to space. We suspected there was a black hole at the center of our galaxy for multiple reasons, but now we've observed it, uh, which is which is a big deal because now we can find out that it's an everything bagel. Mm. Interesting. When you put everything on a bagel. <laughs> it sucks in your galaxy. Yeah. It's yeah. just, I mean, I don't know, black holes. No, thank you. No, uh, no. Well, well, y'all let me them. know how it goes. You need them at the Get center of the of galaxy, but stay at the center of the galaxy. Don't come out here on our spiral yeah, arm, please. Even then, yeah. you never know. And even then, yeah, I mean, because we're taking pictures of it, we're taunting this black hole. I'm with you Sarah. Think it's coming yeah. for us? Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. Whole yeah. On this. It's a lot bigger than the sun. Like the sun is already very scary to me. <laughs> well, the whole, yeah. Now. I don't need anything else in the Milky Way. At, at our sun's point, like medium. At what point in the movie uh, is the protagonist rewarded for taking pictures of the great evil at the center of the universe? I don't remember that. Consider that a much. writing prompt for your next sci-fi novel, everyone. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's check out the mailbag. Oh, uh, let's do it. Uh, uh, this one comes in from Doug um, regarding regenerative braking without brake pads that we were talking about in future EVs uh, last week. Doug wrote in, there are many challenges, but the main issues are not about making regen braking work with stability control, etc., it's a problem of peak power absorption. So other than exotic sports cars, vehicles are capable of braking with a much higher deceleration rate than they can accelerate. What you're, what you're doing when you're doing regen braking, it, braking is you're using the same electric machine that you use for acceleration. It's just in reverse. So think of turning the motor into a generator. All right. Uh, and th there was some good stuff uh, from Doug on this. Thank you for writing in with the with your Thanks, expertise. Doug. Yeah. Uh, in defense of hybrid schedules, remember we asked people like, OK, if you like hybrid work, if you like being in the office a couple days a week, staying at home a couple of days a week, let us know. Todd wrote, I like working from home. I like the flexibility of being able to take a break and do laundry or prep dinner. But I also like being around my coworkers. I feel like we have more productive conversation in the office in between people talking about football or their family. Some people will just never talk on Zoom. And when I'm sitting in an office with them, they have great ideas. Hallway meetings are better than Zoom meetings. Of course, my ideal schedule would be to have the ability to pick which days I'm in the office and which I'm at home. But we can't always get what we want. Uh, thank you, Todd, for coming to the defense of the hybrid schedule. It's good to get that perspective. <laughs> well, thanks also to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, um, you're looking good, man. Uh, what else has been going on? 
Uh, well, I'm heading out to Pennsylvania. So uh, you can uh, follow my coverage there next week on Politics, Politics, Politics as we come to the close of the primaries in the Keystone State. But also get a primer of exactly what's happening right now on the Wednesday episode of that very program. A third uh, candidate has entered the fray in what was a two-man race. Uh, Kathy Barnett making it a, a much more uh, chaotic situation. So follow that. Politics, Politics, Politics. Excellent. And just a reminder, if you have thoughts or comments on anything we talk about on the show, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that feedback. Thank you in advance. We love to hear from you. Also want to extend a special thanks to Travis Falstad, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Travis. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate whoop, you. Whoop, whoop. There's also a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. If you know about it, you know about it, but it is available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Please join us if you can. We're live on this show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 honey UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we are back tomorrow with Shannon Morse and Lynn Peralta joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>